Okay, so I'll speak today about uh, flower formation. I'll speak about morphodynamics, to use a, a term that Elliot very nicely introduced already, at the Shoot Apical Meristem. And before I start, uh, I just would like to uh, briefly, rapidly mention the colleagues with whom I'm, I'm, I'm collaborating on this. First of all, the virtual plant team at Montpellier of uh, uh, Christophe Godin. Uh, we have really been doing a lot of work, and I'll be showing mainly work that we have been doing together with his group. Also acknowledge uh, collaboration with uh, Grégoire Malandin from Sophia Antipolis, and I'll also refer to work that we did together with Elliot Marowitz and Marcus Heisler, uh, and with Henrik Johnson and Paul Krupi uh, yeah, Krupinski. And last but not least, I would like to acknowledge two teams in uh, and people of two teams in my laboratory in Lyon, uh, the team of uh, Areski Boudaoud and Olivier Hamon, so that's the biophysics team, and my own team, uh, in particular postdoc Massimiliano uh, Sassi, who is working on this, uh, on this uh, uh, project. I'd uh, just like to, to mention the main topic uh, that we're interested in, and that is morphogenesis. I will actually speak about uh, shape and shape changes as a result of this uh, 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 um, uh, molecular regulation of these molecular regulations. So what we would like to understand is how do we go from this relatively flat dome at the meristem, these undifferentiated cells, to these structures here, which are the uh, young flower buds with the outgrowing, uh, outgrowing sepals. And so this involves a whole range of uh, morphogenetic processes, like you know, increase in, in, in growth rates, um, growth directions, tissue folding, etc. Now over the last um, 20, 25 years, a whole range of, of genes and molecules have been identified that are involved in this process. And we start to understand some of the interactions between these different molecules and to have an idea of the structure of this uh, regulatory network. And, and Elliot, again, he, he just, you know, talked about part of this, of this network. I will not speak about this, as I just told you, but address another very important question, that is how do we go from this regulatory network at the level of molecules to this structure here, which is the growing flower bud. How do we, uh, how uh, do these molecules control these changes in shape? And that's really a very important question, not only in, in plant developmental biology, but in de developmental biology uh, in general. And a couple of years ago, already in 2004, Rika Cohen, um, uh, but also Przemek Prusenkiewicz and, and Andrew Bangham came up with a very simple concept to address this problem. Well, they reminded us that any change in shape can be described with three main parameters. First of all, uh, growth rate, that is the rate at which a surface or a volume will change in size. And secondly, anisotropy, where anisotropy can have a certain degree uh, and, uh, of course, a certain uh, direction. And what genes seem to do is that locally, at the level of single cells, they will control these regional parameters to create, finally, the shape that we see um, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the end. So if we want to understand the link between molecules and the geometrical shape, well, one of the first uh, things that we have to do is to measure this, uh, this geometry. Now, um, again, we spoke about, or Elliot spoke about abstraction. This is, of course, an abstraction of reality. Because genes do not directly control cell growth, uh, actually what happens is that they uh, uh, affect structural elements in the cell. And one of these structural elements is the, is the cell wall, which really plays a very central role in the control of growth rates and growth directions. Uh, as you know, all the cells are under internal pressure, the turgor pressure. And uh, well, the idea that you find in the literature is that uh, growth occurs because the cell wall yields to this, to this uh, pressure. And it's actually the uh, so the cell wall is composed largely of very rigid cellulose microfibrils that are cross-links to each other. And the idea is that, uh, well, this structure yields here to the internal pressure, and that occurs mainly because there's enzymes that will modify the cell wall, loosen the cell wall, and of course there's also uh, cell wall uh, synthesis. And these will define growth rate. It's the orientation of the microfibrils that will determine or influence the direction at which uh, the cells grow. So really, the cell wall plays a central role in this. And, well, just to illustrate this, when you look at uh, targets of, of transcription factors that are active in the flower, you realize that many of these targets are involved in, in, in cell wall synthesis. And usually when you have this list of targets, you just, you know, 
throw them out because these are just the cell wall genes. But no, these genes are actually doing or are likely to do the job and they are controlling uh, growth, uh, the, the growth rates in, the, at, in this case at the shoot apical marrow step. But okay, let's go back to, to geometry. But as a first step, we have to know what the actual changes in geometry are. And uh, so, well, as this first step, um, well, we decided therefore to measure the actual growth uh, directions and, and growth rates at the shoot table called Meristem. Now that is very easily said, but uh, well, the, the Meristem is a three-dimensional structure uh, and uh, well, it's not very easy to have a real idea to reconstruct this structure in, in three dimensions. And that's why we went to talk to Christophe Godin uh, and, uh, and uh, Grégoire Malandin. And they came up with, uh, with this, uh, well, computational pipeline where we start off with taking uh, pictures from flower buds, growing flower buds, this is live imaging from different angles. And what they do then is they fuse these images and that is that information, because information that you do not see on the one angle, well, you might find it and obtain it by looking at the same meristem on the different angles. Very nicely illustrated here. Here we have a number of cells. You can barely distinguish uh, just by looking at it at one angle, these cell walls. But here, when we have the fused image, we can very nicely see the, 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 the cell walls. And these pictures have the right quality for automatic uh, segmentation. And this is what, uh, what Christophe and Grégoire uh, developed uh, together. And uh, so we now have this, this um, computational pipeline that allows us to reconstruct the meristem in three dimensions and to identify the individual growing cells at objects that, as objects that, uh, that, that, can be, uh, that can be measured. Um, now, this is uh, still work still is, is still in progress. I just presented on one slide, but it's really an enormous amount of work and has an enormous amount of, uh, of development. What we want to do is to use this method to uh, compare, for instance, mutants and wild type to see where actually uh, gene function affects uh, growth. We also want to use this, uh, this system to measure, uh, or this pipeline to measure growth rates uh, in particular domains, expression domains. The idea is that if we here have the, the Calavata 3 domain in the young flower bud, uh, well, certain genes will be on, other genes are, will be off. So the state of the regulatory network will be associated with certain uh, growth direction, certain growth rates. And this is how we're going to associate a gene function to uh, a, a geometry. But, uh, well, let's also have, I mean, we, we're still in the process of analyzing this, so I will not present uh, you know, a major analysis uh, of, uh, of growth patterns at, uh, at uh, the young flower bud. Uh, just one a single result of uh, uh, growth rates here at the surface. Here we have two, uh, one flower bud, two pictures of one flower bud that is growing out. I hope you can see it. Uh, and here we have the changes in volume between this and this stage. And well, what you can see is that, well, we have here cells that are growing very rapidly, cells that are, that are growing much more slowly. What we also see is that, you know, cells that are growing very rapidly are next to cells that are growing more, more, more slowly. So we're getting, you know, a fairly complex picture if you look at, at the, the details of the, of the growing patterns. And the question then that, you have, that we have is, well, what are the simplest hypotheses we can propose to explain these growth patterns? Um, well, to, to illustrate the question, uh, just a very simple situation where we have just a tissue of nine cells at the beginning, and here we have the same uh, population of nine cells, but after a certain period of time. So what are the hypotheses we can propose to go from there to there? Well, we can say, well, we have different growth rates. One, two, three, four different growth rates. Maybe these are associated with different um, gene activities, um, and then we can look for those gene activities. Another explanation is that the cells physically interact with each other, and it's actually only this cell that receives the instruction from the molecular network to grow, and the others have a sort of system that allows them to adapt physically to uh, that, uh, that cell in the center. So this is another possibility. You can maybe can up, come up with other um, explanations and hypotheses. Um, and, well, in this case, it's a very simple situation, only nine cells. But so if we then return to reality, and we look here at the detail, the detailed growth map 
uh, of, a, of a young growing uh, flower bud with, uh, well, this is the flower bud, the main meristem, and here the, 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 the boundary, where you realize it's much more difficult to explain these patterns of growth on a purely intuitive basis. And uh, well, obviously what we have to do is to use uh, models. And what we have set out to do together with, uh, with uh, Christophe is to develop models in the form of virtual tissue able to express uh, physical properties of the cells. Okay, so how do you express gene function in, uh, in such a model? Well, as I told you, uh, the idea is that genes influence the cell wall and that will then create local growth rates and growth uh, directions. So what we did in our model, what we do in our model, is to express gene function in terms of local modifications in the biophysical properties of the, of the cell walls, okay? So we will not uh, have genes instructing cells to grow at a certain rate or in a certain direction. So how can you do that? Well, there are different ways to do that, to, to, uh, to develop such uh, uh, mechanical models. One uh, that we have been using with, with Christophe, but also with Henrik Johnson, is based on the use of, uh, of springs. So a spring has a certain rest length, it has a, it has a real length, and you can make uh, you know, this network of spring, and then every cell wall here uh, is represented by a spring. You can put that under, under tension, and then the forces exerted here to these cell corners will depend, of course, on the difference between L and L0, but also on the stiffness on the spring. You can then introduce growth in such a system by synthesizing new, uh, new uh, uh, springs, or new, uh, uh, to, to lengthen, actually, the spring, to change the, the rest length of these uh, spring. However, um, these uh, networks of spring are not uh, very appropriate if you're interested in three-dimensional structure. So that's why we've moved to the use of uh, finite elements. I will not go into any details here, but the idea is that you split up here your cells, and this is done by, by Henrik Johnson uh, a couple of years ago, in multiple um, surfaces with, and every surface has a particular uh, mechanical properties, okay? And uh, so we can use this, well, this is also finite element models also used to describe, for instance, uh, uh, mechanical properties uh, and forces uh, in, uh, in airplanes, in, in buildings, etc. But you can also use it, uh, well, to describe uh, tissues. Of course, the problem is here that this is not a building, this is a living structure. It is, uh, it is, uh, it is growing. So uh, Jérôme Chopin in, in Christophe's group then designed uh, the following, well, you can again use it a pipeline. We start from the initial picture, uh, segment the cells, as I've shown you before, using this, uh, this segmentation uh, uh, program, and then use the segmented image as a template to create the model. Um, and you will see the uh, finite elements here appear. I mean, it's less detailed than in this case because uh, well, we're dealing with a growth. We want to model a growing system, so we don't have as many finite elements. But nevertheless, here's the model, and we can start to play with it, okay? So in the remaining part of my talk, what I will do is to tell you how we are using the model to propose hypothesis. And well, since we're only at the beginning, I'll only present you our first qualitative attempts to model organ outgrowth. So we're just trying to play with the model and see if we can have it produce a, uh, a primordium. So what instructions would you give here to this model to have it make uh, an organ? Well, what is the simplest possible hypothesis? Well, one idea is that in young organ primordia you find a whole range of uh, genes expressed that are associated with cell proliferation. In the young flower we have integumenta, for instance, that has been associated with uh, increased uh, uh, growth rate. So the most simple hypothesis would be that uh, in a young growing primordium, the cells, the genes cause loosening of the cell walls. So we can take our model, we can choose a number of cells here and loosen the cell walls, the mechanical elements in these, uh, in these, uh, in these cells. And here you see the result of this uh, simulation. These are the cells here that were selected. The cell walls were, were, were loosened. And here you see the final result. I hope you can see it. A very nice bump that is growing out of this, uh, of this uh, model. So we get a very nice defined primordium if you want. And uh, interestingly, although we didn't really uh, program this, we see that these cells start to grow in certain directions. So although we only program the stiffness of the cell walls, um, in the end, we get the anisotropy uh, for free, okay? So we start to, to have some very interesting uh, properties there. 
The thing is, okay, this is a very simple hypothesis, but how plausible is it? And when you go back to the literature, you realize that meristems are physically not homogeneous. Um, and in particular, you find a very, very strong um, idea, that is that the outer layer of the meristem is more rigid than the inter inner layer. So, um, therefore, we take again our model and we introduce this information as well in the model and we make the surface layer five times more rigid than the internal cells, okay? So this time, since we want to make a flower, we uh, choose four zones of cells that will uh, loosen their cell walls and of course we have this surface layer being more rigid than the internal uh, cell layer. And here you see the result of this uh, simulation. This time what you see is that, okay, we still have cells that are growing more quickly than others, that, that, that's fine, that's what you expect in a young promodium, but uh, we do not see a very nicely defined bump or, uh, that, that is growing out. We don't see a very nicely defined boundary. So the question is, okay, we have added an hypothesis there that we find in the literature, but we don't find this time back something that we, uh, where we, that we would like to see that is nicely defined promodia. So um, we go back to the data, the growth data that I showed you before, and when you do that, you realize that actually at the level of the boundary here of the primordium, here's the boundary, these are these cells, um, the cells are growing at an extremely low rate. So, um, therefore, we can add a third hypothesis to our model and say, well, okay, these cells apparently have to grow very slowly, and so uh, what we do is we make the cell walls in these cells very, very rigid so that they will uh, grow much more uh, slowly. And uh, so the result is, uh, is shown here in, in, this, in this small movie. So we have these red cells um, that, where the cell wall is loosened. Here we have these boundary zones where the, the, the cell walls are rigid. And we have the uh, internal tissues that are mechanically uh, very, very weak. And here you see the result of this, uh, of this uh, uh, simulation. And, well, I realize that I have to show you this one because I had to change computers because there was this problem with my computer, so I, I put the wrong movie in. But here you see the, the result of that, of that simulation. What you see is uh, that, uh, um, that uh, we have, again, very nicely defined uh, primordia here and here, uh, very nicely defined uh, boundary here and here. And uh, so this means that a surface more rigid than the interior cell wall loosening in organs and boundary stiffer um, with stiffer walls gives you a shape that starts to look like a uh, that starts to look like a flower. Of course, there's still a lot of difference between this structure and the real uh, young flower bud. But nevertheless, we start to approach something that that looks like a, that looks uh, like like a flower. And actually, the, the movie I showed was for the uh, second uh, simulation. I apologize for that. Okay. So, okay, uh, now we, we start to have uh, an idea of the type of hypothesis that we have to introduce. Um, and still, wall loosening is a very strong part, uh, it's a very strong hypothesis in this, but how to test this, okay? So if wall stiffness should be reduced in a primordia, well, we have to somehow test that hypothesis. And how do you do that? Well, we um, were contacted by uh, uh, colleagues close by, uh, physicists close by from the Laboratoire Joli, Joliot Curie, and they said, well, what you have to do is to measure physical properties uh, of, the, of the cell wall. And uh, so Olivier and I then went to see them, and what they proposed us is to use atomic force microscope. And, well, I'll try to explain how this, uh, how this works very briefly. We have a cantilever and a very fine uh, point or needle, if you want, uh, that is in the nanometer uh, range, a very, very fine point, and you just push then on the, on the, on the, on the surface uh, of your uh, meristem, for instance, and this will cause the cantilever to bend, uh, and this bending is then measured, uh, and this pushing is, is uh, um, um, done by a piezoelectric uh, system, and then the bending of this cantilever is me measured using a, a laser. So depending on how um, stiff your surface is, you get uh, bending curves, that, uh, that, can be, that can be different. Um, and well, of course, if you have a very stiff surface, you get a different curve from uh, when you are just pushing on an elastic surface, because first of all, the elastic surface will yield, and only then when you're pushing further, you know, it, will, um, it, it will become more and more difficult to deform or to change the, 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 the shape uh, of this uh, elastic uh, surface. 
Another problem we encountered is, well, okay, um, the meristem itself is completely covered by, by flower buds. How do we access uh, the atomic force micro with the atomic force microscope? And, well, we haven't really found a very good uh, uh, solution, but one of the solutions we found was to use this mutant, the pin-formed mutant, uh, which doesn't transport oxygen, is un unable to initiate primordia. And what um, DJ Reinhardt showed a long time ago, that when you add oxygen to this mutant, you get a formation of a, of a flower uh, structure or, or primordia, and we use this system to uh, measure actually the mechanical properties at the surface of this, of this meristem. So here's the, the, the setup, here we have the donor of the meristem, here we have organs forming, and here we have the auxin application. And well, that, that we do access with this microscope, the meristem is shown here, where we have just uh, touched the surface of the meristem to make an image using this atomic force microscope. And you see you have a very nice detailed image of the, uh, of the meristem uh, surface. And now, uh, with, together with uh, Pascal uh, Milani, uh, Olivier started to, to look at the mechanical properties of the different parts of the, uh, of the meristem. And these are very preliminary results. I mean, I, I, just to show that, that uh, well, we start to have uh, a number of, of data already. So here we have a control, which is uh, a mica, a very uh, um, stiff surface, of course. And here we have a curves for the uh, top of the dome. This would be this part here. And here we have curves for the, 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 the periphery and also the periphery after having uh, added uh, auxin. So, uh, well, one thing, first of all, is that we see that at the top of the dome, uh, the cell walls apparently are much stiffer than at uh, the periphery. So, yes, uh, differences in stiffness do seem to exist and are being used uh, by, the, by the meristem. However, in these preliminary results, we couldn't distinguish really clearly the difference between um, well, an initium and the, uh, and the peripheral cells, suggesting that maybe, but I say this needs to be confirmed, that uh, our hypothesis that cell walls are loosened in the young primordium is, uh, is wrong, okay? That is that there's no clear difference uh, in stiffness. So although we still have to confirm this, as I said, uh, this nevertheless asks the question, okay, if elasticity of the meristem is not modified, are there other hypotheses that could explain the formation of a young primordium? And, well, so far I haven't uh, uh, spoken about anisotropy. I only have spoken about how stiff the cell wall is. And uh, yet anisotropy plays a very important role. Uh, as I, I told you before, it's the orientation of the cellulose microfibrils that, de that defines at what, in what direction a cell would like to grow. Um, and, well, the orientation of the cellulose microfibrils depends on the orientation of the uh, microtubules. And, well, a while ago, and this was a, a collaboration in involving uh, uh, our teams in, in Lyon and, and also Areski Boudaoud when he was still in Paris, but also with Marcus Heisler and Elliot uh, Meyerowitz. Um, we uh, looked at the pattern of microtubule distribution at the shoot apical meristem, and this is what you find. Uh, random orientations um, suggesting uh, isotropic cell walls at the tip of the dome and here at the tip of the young primordia and uh, highly ordered microtubules, highly anisotropic cell walls uh, most likely at the organ boundaries and also here around the, the, the stems. Here you see a detail uh, showing the random microtubules in a young uh, organ primordium and here you see the more ordered uh, microtubules here um, at the stem and also as they occur uh, in this uh, in this uh, place here. So the uh, question then that we, we asked is, okay, if we now take the same model that we had before, but this time we only play with isotropy and uh, anisotropy, can we also get the outgrowth of an organ primordium? So uh, we have the same model as we had before. The surface is five times more rigid than the inside, but this time all the cells at the surface have the same mean mechanical strength. Okay. So basically, if you would use an atomic force microscope, you wouldn't be able to see the difference between this cell and this cell or, or this cell. However, uh, some cells would be highly um, isotropic, and this would be the case here for these cells and these cells at the tip of the dome, where other cells would be anisotropic. Um, that is, that the finite elements are more rigid in, in one uh, direction. And um, oh, I hope this time I have the, the right... Yeah, it looks like the right one. 
Um, and here you see the result of this, uh, of this simulation. Uh, and what you see is that, well, we do have something that, again, starts to look like a, a bump that is growing out of the meristem. Uh, and this is only by playing with uh, anisotropy. Uh, interestingly, what we see is that these cells here at this boundary zone grow more slowly than the cells here in this young primordia. And this is not due to differences in uh, cell wall loosening. This is entirely due to differences in anisotropy and, of course, physical interactions uh, between the cells. So here we have programmed the anisotropy, but we get differences in growth rates for free. So just the opposite of what we had in the, in the first uh, uh, simulation. Okay. So... Um, to conclude, a simple modification of local anisotropy can also explain organ outgrowth and dif differential growth rates. But of course, further testing of the potential of the role of anisotropy in the meristem is, is required. And we now have a lot of experimental work to do to, uh, to, to test the, the, the hypothesis in parallel to further developing, of course, our models. Okay, so now back to the conclusions. Uh, first of all, we developed uh, um, imaging pipeline called Mars Alt uh, that allows us to study morphodynamics uh, in the growing flower. Uh, we have developed 3D modeling tools to show that differences, scenarios can account for organ initiation. Atomic force microscopy can help to <coughs> discriminate between these scenarios, and a change in anisotropy could be the first event leading to uh, organ initiation, or at least that's one of the hypotheses that we uh, want to test. The very last uh, slide. To, to say that the model I've shown you is, of course, the very first primitive version. For instance, we do not have cell division. We do not have, at this moment, any regulatory network uh, in there. We just say, well, okay, this cell is going to express this gene, and this is going to cause uh, these changes in, uh, in, in the rigidity or the, the, the stiffness of the, of the cell wall. So we also have to introduce simple molecular network models uh, and, of course, uh, gene expression uh, patterns, etc. Okay, so I already uh, uh, presented to the main collaborators in Atma at the introduction. So if there's any time left, I'll be happy to uh, take uh, questions. Thank you. I was wondering whether Turger affects the atomic force microscopy measurement. So is a rigid, you know, if you may take a balloon blown or not blown, will it give you the same result for yeah. the material? Well, um, that has been a long discussion uh, that, 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 that we've had in the lab and that has been uh, tested and, and modeled as well. The type of atomic force microscope that is being used here is supposed to measure only the, the real surface of the, or the, 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 yeah, it is not going to measure the physical properties beyond the thickness of the, of the cell wall. So basically, if you plasmalize the cells, you would find exactly the same, same results. You can use other uh, thicker uh, uh, tips and then you also start to measure what is happening uh, below. But with, with this instrument that we have used, this is not uh, the, the, the case. <laughs>